Hey, what's up guys? This is Josh Blue and welcome to the Patent State Conference. Oh yeah. Hello, I'm Daniel McNulty, State Director of the Patents Project. It's my pleasure to have with me here today uh, Dr. Joy Zabala, Director of Technical Assistance at the National AIM Center and CAST. Welcome, Joy. Hi, Daniel. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> Now, I say AIM Center, Director of Technical Assistance at the National AIM Center, and I've noticed that AIM is now spelled with an E instead of an I. That's correct. Um, there has been a change at, at the Office of Special Education Programs in how the, the language goes, but there's been no change in the program itself. So accessible instructional materials, okay. accessible educational materials, which is the new center, mm -hmm. and we could even talk about accessible learning materials. So instructional um, learning, uh, educational, same things. Kind of all mean the same things. They all mean the same things when we think about them generically, yes. Okay, okay. So as far as um, on that national level, looking at accessible educational, instructional learning materials, um, the website has changed a little bit. The look of the website has changed a little bit. But as far as supports and, and te the technical assistance that you, that you are directing um, to the states, uh, what do you anticipate changing in the next couple of years? A little while? Yeah. Well, probably a lot of things will be to continue to assist states in um, implementation mm -hmm. uh, of accessible materials. I think that there was a lot of emphasis in the last AIM Center mm -hmm. on the the ways to acquire the materials. Okay. In this in this round of funding, then we'll be looking a lot at using those materials. Good, good. That's yeah. exciting. Um, we've, we've obviously still got a lot of work to do on the acquisition of materials yes, and, the, and the, uh, the delivery of materials, but then the implementation of materials I think is really exciting. As far as, w what about people on that national level at the, ca at the National AIM Center at CAST? All the same folks working with you? Pretty much. Um, this is a little bit different because the NIMAS Center, or the NIMAS Board, mm -hmm. and the AIM Center, mm -hmm. the AIM Center mm -hmm. that has just finished, are, are both now in one center. Okay. So Skip Stahl and, and Chuck Hitchcock are the co-directors of the new center, the AEM Center, which we still call AIM. Right. Um, and then I'm the director of technical assistance, so we work very closely together. And we have several other people who work with us as well. Okay. Just all under that umbrella of AEM now. Correct. Got it. So let's talk about, um, when we talk about looking forward into the next few years and uh, things that might be changing, one thing that uh, is a little bit scary to me and, and has been brought up between me and, and in various meetings and audiences that I've spoken to is, is NIMAS and, and the fact that NIMAS applies only to printed K-12 materials. And as we move forward into this era of digital materials, uh, can you talk about changes that may or may not be on the horizon in that regard? Well, one of the things that you know is that NIMAS applies only to print mm -hmm. and also to K-12. Um, even though there is, there has been some reach into higher education mm -hmm. with with um, that particular work, but there will be part of part of the work of the new center is to align the the um, NIMAS work mm -hmm. with work that publishers are doing in their in their typical workflow, mm -hmm. looking a lot at EPUB three, which okay. is what's being used to um, create many many digital materials. Um, right. So, with with putting those two things together, because EPUB three has a very high level of accessibility in it, so right. we look at print for co to continue to talk about NIMAS okay. in print, and then look at um, really looking at the EPUB three, WCAG two point okay. those kinds of things as as the move toward digital continues. Right. Because one of the things we know, mm -hmm. even though there are lots and lots of digital materials out there, mm -hmm. there are also still lots and lots of print materials. Right, right. Yeah, so it's important to note that the, the NIMIS is not going away. It's still an important technical standard for those printed materials. Correct. At this time, that is the case. Yes, yes. And so even if, let's say even if publishers decided tomorrow that they were completely, all publishers were completely done producing printed materials, um, we'd still, That'd be e interesting. even <laughs> if that happened, we'd still have years and years of, of printed materials in the past, uh, between 2006 and, and 2014, uh, that the NIMAS technical standard would, would need to apply to. Absolutely. Okay. 
Good. So then when we talk about the accessibility of those of those digital materials, those materials that were that are intended to be used digitally. That's how why they why they were created, how they were created. How how I know you mentioned a couple of standards with the EPUB three. Um, how does a school district know when they're t when they're working with a publisher whether those digital materials are in fact accessible? Well, there's sort of two levels. There are certainly people who are the the techies, and I mm -hmm. sort of call Chuck and Skip my techies. Mm -hmm. um, they they know those things. Uh, for me, if I asked, uh, so Daniel, you're the publisher. Are your materials um, WCAG 2.0 compliant? Mm -hmm. And I say, yeah, of course they are. And then you probably say, yes, of course they are. They're digital, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> As though that means the same thing, which, right. it, of course, it doesn't. And so I've been thinking a lot about, okay, what about people like me, people mm -hmm. who are in the classroom or spend their time in the classroom? What does this mean to me? Because if you say it to me, all I can say is, oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. Or, mm -hmm. you know, I know it's supposed to be that way. So we really talk about... Um, a lot about so what are the things that you could actually see I, I call them the show me things yeah, um, yeah. even though I'm not from Missouri <laughs> so uh, basically like one of the there are many many things but one of them is that that uh, to be really accessible that a material would run on multiple platforms okay devices okay. and operating, devices, systems. operating okay. systems so I would I might say to you, oh, you you say that your materials do this. Well, here are the four that we use in my classroom, okay. or here are the four that we use in our school. Show me. Right, um, right. It has to. I would have to be accessible in, in order to be accessible, it would have to um, have alt tags for any images that name mm -hmm. those images, mm -hmm. and then a more extended um, description of the images. Mm -hmm. But we would want those images those those tags mm -hmm. to also be voiced. Right. So I could say, oh, do yours do that? Let me let me hear what it sounds like. Okay, okay. And there are many things that, that would work that way. Gotcha. So you could have an iPad, you could have a, uh, an Android tablet, and then a Chromebook over here, and then a full computer. And really, as the publisher, I'd need to demonstrate that, for example, those those alternate descriptions in those images would could be voiced on all those different devices. Exactly. And that, that brings up an interesting point. Um, something that I'm particularly interested in is the whole bring your own device to schools. I think uh, I, I see more and more schools kind of going that way. And, and several schools in the last couple of years who've um, chosen one thing, let's say they've chosen iPads or chosen Chromebooks and gone district wide with it, after a year or two of reevaluating that and saying, okay, we're, we're going to keep these devices we bought, but now you can bring anything you want as well. What, what are your thoughts on that as far as accessibility? And it's very interesting because I, I would, there, one part of the, it, it would be very positive mm -hmm. because one would assume that if you brought it, that you knew how it worked. Yeah, it's yours, you've been using it, you're familiar with right. it. Right, right, right. But that means the content that you're going to display has to meet that standard mm -hmm. of being able to be on multiple platforms and to run on multiple platforms well. Yeah. Otherwise, you would be in a situation where yeah. you had all this as this technology that is usable by the students that the content won't run on. Yeah. And so you 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 lose your accessibility there. Right. So so when you mentioned that 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 just kind of drove home that point for me that we really need we really need to talk be talking to publishers about all the possible things we might ever use it for, not just what we have now. Yes, exactly. Because as you know, technology is changing so quickly. Right. I think one of the things that I find interesting is I would, I sometimes would say, well, this particular content is not very accessible. Mm -hmm. And then someone says, oh yes, but I can make it accessible by doing this, this, and this. Yeah. And so they're using their technology. And of course, the people yeah. who do technology um, are especially assistive technology, are working really hard to take something that isn't accessible yeah. and make it accessible, yeah. which is good, mm -hmm. except that then that takes the, takes the responsibility for creating something that is accessible as possible yeah. from the start off of the publisher. Right. And you really, want, you really want everybody to do their piece. So. Yes. Yeah, and so when I talk sometimes about universal design and assistive technology, that's, that's more or less the, one of the differentiating points that I make is 
if it had been designed at the start level that you mentioned to be a, as accessible as possible, that's, that's more universal design. But then somebody like us taking it and doing things to it to make it accessible is more assistive tech. Right. And one of the things that happens, and this is the, the Online Center for Students with Disabilities, mm -hmm. um, has made a, a comment that at this time, school districts and state departments of education basically do not have the capability to retrofit digital content. Right. Where we, we know a lot about retrofitting print. Print, yeah. But digital content, if it's not designed to be accessible from the very beginning, mm -hmm. It's it's a problem. Yeah, yeah, and I yeah I'm just going to mention that again because I that you're exactly right. That's a huge problem I think. So I think what you're what you're saying is materials that were created digitally, never a print version of them. If they're not accessible, they're actually far more difficult for somebody like us to make accessible than print was. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. And I think a lot of schools, you, you, you mentioned uh, just a couple seconds ago that digital does not equal accessible. And I think that's a mistake that a lot of districts have and, and are still making. So for me, thinking about accessibility broadly mm -hmm. is that there may not be a standard set of accessibility features that work for everyone. Right. So when we think about accessible digital materials, in addition to meeting standards mm -hmm. such as WCAG 2.0, which down the road maybe 3.0 or whatever, right, right. but at present we're looking at 2.0, then we still have to be aware that we want a very feature rich material. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that yeah. every person will use every feature. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's some pushback on that, but mm -hmm. oh, that'll be too many features. Mm -hmm. Well, what I say a lot of times is, have you ever worked on, have you ever been to a government website? Oh yeah, well, um, they all have to be 508 compliant, which means that they can be read with a screen reader. And did that get in your way? <laughs> That's and a the good person example. says, I don't use a screen reader. And I said, well, did you see anything <laughs> that disturbed you or distracted you? No, I think mine wasn't, ex it didn't have that in mind. <laughs> oh yeah, it did. Yeah, it did. Yeah, it did. <laughs> it's just that you didn't need that, so right. it didn't come up for you. And right. then when we think about accessibility in our instructional materials, it's the same kind of thing. It might be turning on an option, turning off an option, uh -huh. but it's not like, oh my goodness, we have to go get another material. Yeah, that's a great example. That makes sense. So then let's talk about a little bit uh, AIM, A-E-M or A-I-M or learning materials We'll talk about A-E-M from now on. <laughs> okay. But we're still going to call it AIM. So. Okay. So AIM with an E in the IEP. Yes. So with, with a case conference committee gets together and, and uh, maybe an evaluation has been done, maybe it hasn't been done as far as assistive tech and AIM, but how do you, how do you see these accessible educational materials fitting into that process, that case conference process? Well, one of the things that we know or we've learned over these years is that there are really lots of places where you could potentially mention AIM in the development of the IEP, mm -hmm. all the way from consideration mm -hmm. um, through the entire IEP process. I think um, what, what you probably need to think about is it's not just a one place kind of right. thing. Right. Um, what would be important though in a state would be to really help help all of all of the the um, local education agencies really understand and decide upon maybe where where are you going to put it or how yeah. is it going to look. Yeah. We do a, a webinar from the AIM Center fairly regularly and there are also archives of this webinar that are available now mm -hmm. called AIM in the IEP. And it yeah. looks at I think nine different areas and gives an example of what would AIM language look like at this particular part. When you're doing gotcha. an assessment, how might AIM language be expressed mm -hmm. so that people would know about it. If it's in a goal, um, if it's in presence level, pre if it's in present levels of achievement or performance, uh -huh. then to me, that's a place where you'd want to be very clear that mm -hmm. if someone has met that particular present level mm -hmm. and they've been using accessible materials or assistive technology, that it would be in there. Daniel using Daniel's, you know, when Daniel uses digital text yeah. and his super alpha numerator, then he reads at grade level yeah. and, you yeah. know, you see what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Instead of just Daniel reads at grade level. Right. right. And then I might get Daniel in my class next year and he, he's not reading at grade right. level. Well, no, not without 
audio supported reading or right. something like that. Right, so right. we'd want to make sure. But but in the webinar, we take we go all the way through the eight steps and say, okay, nice. where would it be? What would it look like here? Mm. What would it look like here? Nice. Yeah, and that's and that's important. I think we have in the state of Indiana, we've got uh, Indiana IEP, which not all districts use, but most by far mm. use it. And so that's that's kind of good on a state level. We have that one system that we can work with. And so there are specific points in there where it's obvious that that aim should be discussed. Right. But it's a really great point to note that that's not the only place. That's an important place for it to be discussed, but it's not the only place. And that present levels of, of performance is a crucial place that I think a lot of people miss. And so I know you talk a lot about the need, selection, and the acquisition. The need, the selection, the acquisition, and the use of accessible materials. Right. Um, when we're thinking about those four terms, do they need it, how, how are we going to get it, and, and where, and then how are we going to actually implement it, where do you see something like um, the Protocol for Accommodations in Reading, or the UPAR, that sort of assessment fitting into that process? Right. To me, uh, um, it fits very well in the, the, in the selection part, mm -hmm. because students who are blind or visually impaired mm -hmm. usually Oh, well, not usually. They must have a, a teacher of the visually impaired involved in their processing. Right. They also have the learning media assessment. Lots of, of right. data is collected about what type of materials would be useful. Mm -hmm. But for students with high incidence disabilities, like learning disabilities, there really hasn't been a tool that we could say, okay, go through this tool. So it may be very helpful. Yeah. I think we don't want, we want to make sure that, that we also keep thinking about those informal reading inventories and, and other sorts of data that, mm -hmm. that would be useful. Mm -hmm. But I think the UPAR fits very well in that selection part. Yeah, I agree. And then, what, so what about, we get, to, we get to the use, we get to the implementation part. And something I'm really interested in, and I think you probably are too, is the data collection at that point. How do we know that once we've gone through this process and all this work, we've acquired the materials, and now we're implementing them, we've trained the student on how to use the device, separate from the content, and now, now we're actually implementing these materials. What, what's data look like at that point? How do we show that it's working or not? Wouldn't we love to know that? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, that's really something that's, uh, I think there are people who do know that. Yeah on an individual case-by-case case yeah. basis. Yeah. You know, if you're working with a student and you have seen a change in that student's independence, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that where perhaps somebody had to read to them before, right. and now they can read to themselves, and right. then there, there are levels of that. Maybe you can operate your technology and you can read um, using your whatever materials, whatever format you're using. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But are you going and getting that content independently? You know, mm -hmm. there's there's right. a lot of potential steps that I think we could think about. Right. Um, certainly, we also want to think about preparation. Yeah. Let's say everybody's supposed to have read chapter three to come in for the discussion today. Mm -hmm. And I am not a person who could have read chapter three mm -hmm. very well uh, by myself. And now I come prepared and yeah. I can be a part of the discussion. Yeah. Um, so those kinds of changes, and of course, down the road, and I use that term really not knowing if it's a short road or a long road, <laughs> okay. um, then we would expect to see changes in outcomes. Yeah. At this point, we're still a little bit iffy on use, yep. and I think one of the things in the new center, well I know one of the things in the new center that's really important, is we're going to need to be able to operationalize use in mm -hmm. some way. What does it mean? To, use to actually use it. these. Now, having yeah. it available once a week, probably that's not use. Right, right. Okay, so there, I think for me, I've also been thinking about the quiet work and looking at um, the quality indicators for implementation. Okay. And one of those quality indicators is that, th and it's talking about assistive technology, of course, mm -hmm. but that it's embedded in the natural activities that the mm. student does every day. Right. You know, right. that's, to me, that's going to be a part of that operationalizing use. Yeah. It's going to be, can the student use the, the um, material, mm -hmm. both, both the technology and the content, right. when and where they need to use it? Right. Is it available to them and they mm -hmm. know how to do it and they, they, they do it? Right, right. That's a, that's a wonderful outcome. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure that um, a change in performance on the statewide 
assessment is going to be, I mean, yes, yeah. we want that yeah. eventually to be an outcome, right. but we don't want people to be disappointed three months later that suddenly the child's score right. just went. Right. Might happen for some, but it I don't think it's yeah. gonna be our typical measure that we want to use. Yeah, and so that's exactly where I wanted you to go with that question. That okay. so, so whether it's a long <laughs> road or a short road, it's probably gonna be a bumpy road because cause there's so many different aspects of outcomes. Yes. And so, uh, you know, may maybe way down here, we do have that, uh, state assessment, and which is w where we want kids to do better, of course, but it's not the only thing no. uh, by far. Um, and so I think that's, there's so much emphasis, at least in Indiana, probably in other states as well. Oh no, no other <laughs> states even worried about those big assessments. <laughs> good, <laughs> Only good, Indiana. Good, we'll take care of it. Um, there's so much emphasis on it that we kind of, we kind of forget all these other little bumps that we should also be measuring along that road. And I really like that you talked about increased student independence and students coming to class having read something they would have never come to class having read before uh, without those materials being available in the device. Um, so yeah, I like, I like the idea of measuring outcomes in, in multiple ways like that. Um, and it being Which we're actually charged for doing in yeah, IDEA yeah, right. and actually in No Child Left Behind or mm -hmm. the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we should be. It's just, we're just not <laughs> in a no, lot of not. cases. That, that one single measure has uh, become a very large. It has, it has. So let's, let's still go in that direction just for a few minutes here and maybe talk about your session uh, at our state conference. Um, accommodations and, and, or every day, every day is a high stakes day and we're talking about accommodations throughout those 175 school days in contrast to those five days of testing. And you know, I, I heard that term spoken by a really wise person. Yeah. And yeah. I snatched it for myself immediately. <laughs> Good. <laughs> because uh, Daniel McNulty was asked a question <laughs> about those five days of testing, and you and your answer was, "Well, I'm really concerned about the other 175 days." And for me, uh -huh. that was like a big light went on. You know, even though I would say. I always was very concerned yeah, yeah. about implementation and, and building it into the typical, mm -hmm. the typical learning situation and learning time. That, that sort of visual of, of 175 days as yeah. opposed to five, I think one of the things that's really a concern mm -hmm. of mine is that when we think about the accommodations that are available in testing, mm -hmm. which while they're increasingly robust, they're really lots of... Um, they're pretty limited. Pretty li yes, they're thank pretty you. Limited. Thank you for saying that, <laughs> yes. They, there are still many limitations. Yeah. And many what I think are probably um, erroneous assumptions maybe in, in those, and I, the one I would say the most erroneous assumption is that you don't, you don't provide text to speech for reading until sixth grade because right. they're learning to read before that. Right. So then what happens is the assessment becomes a validation of what we already know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. somebody can't do right. rather than an opportunity for them to show what they can do. Yes. You know, yes. that if, if, we, if we make reading too much about decoding, then we miss all of those other really important parts of what makes reading. Yep. So what I think is, is important is that we think about what, what is allowable in those five days, mm -hmm. and we make sure that in instruction, we're providing multiple opportunities for yeah. students to practice that, right. but we're not limiting what we provide yes. in instruction to that. Yes, yes. I think that's, that's a really big thing. If, if we do that, then it's, it's all about opportunity to learn, uh -huh. not opportunity to be tested. Yes, yes. You know? Absolutely. Certainly we want to have opportunity to show what we have learned. Uh -huh. But that opportunity to learn piece in those other 175 days right. should really be thinking about that independence and about that yep. preparation and, yep. and about that achievement that's happening in those days as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and, and really we know we, we know almost for certain that we have to have students who are engaged in whatever is happening in order for learning to happen. And so if, we're, if really we're going to focus on those five days and the outcomes of those five days of testing, then, then what we want are engaged learners for 175 days. Exactly. So even if we have to take away some of those avenues uh, for those five days of testing, they're still going to do better, m most likely, on those five days of testing 
than if they had been disengaged for 175 oh, days. Oh, absolutely. Uh, David Rose would, you know, would give you a kiss <laughs> for that. <laughs> and, and also, so I've heard that there has been some research, I can't tell you whose research, there has been some research that saying that if you are an engaged learner in all those days, mm -hmm. those 175, yeah. that when you get to those five, yeah. you still will do better yeah, yeah, yeah. than if we didn't provide them to you. Right. Yeah, right. During during those 175 yeah. days. So your key uh, your key point, I think, in my opinion, is to not to not let whatever's allowed or not allowed during those five days limit what happens during the rest. Absolutely, yeah. because you're limiting a student's opportunity to learn, mm -hmm. and there's something that doesn't really sit right yeah. with an educator about that. I would say. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Well, very good. I appreciate your time with us, Joy, and this will, this will be very beneficial to, uh, to our viewers and especially to our Aiming for Achievement grant schools uh, that will be starting this week, and uh, I appreciate your wisdom once again. Well, I want to say for a moment, uh, those, those, those eight districts that are coming together to yes. do the Aiming for Achievement, what an exciting opportunity. Yes. I think um, to have the work that Patents has done for, what, 20 years now? Almost 20, I think this is 19, yeah. <laughs> really looking at universal design for learning, mm -hmm. really looking at accessible materials, and now looking deeply mm -hmm. at, at those accessible materials, thinking yeah. about not just considering does a student need them, not just can you get them from this place or that place, but really thinking about needs, selection, acquisition, and the reason we do those three things, use. use. And to have that close relationship with the supports that are available mm -hmm. to, to the districts from patents, mm -hmm. and of course from us through, through you, right. and directly, um, lots, of, lots of nice opportunities to move forward. And I personally, and professionally as well, will look forward to the outcomes of all of that. I, want to, I really am looking forward to what, what you discover and what your people discover as they're using these materials with students. Excellent. It'll be a little bit of work and there'll be some, some learning as we go, but uh, I, you mentioned something that I want to make a point of as well. We look forward to, uh, to continuing to work with CAST on this, and I understand there's some webinar opportunities that, that may be available to these eight districts that we're Absolutely. working with. Absolutely. Just ask. We'll find a time. Great. That'd be great. Excellent. Thank you, Joy. You're welcome. Thank you, Daniel.